So in the first games back, Porto lose, Benfica and Sporting draw. Who thought they'd be camera shy? Welcome to another edition of Lockdown Football. We'll definitely have to change the name soon. Will Downing with you alongside my fellow commentators, Mark Rodden, Dimitro Zulai and Stefan Jorni. A couple of players with interesting stories for you today. Later on, we're talking to Marcus Pum, who's come a long way from being a schoolboy in the stands, seeing his father, Mark Pum, keep goal for Derby, Sunderland, Watford and Arsenal. Now he's a league winner in his own right, an international footballer and still only 21. But first, a man who became the first Irish player in 10 years to feature in the Club World Cup when he lined out for Team Wellington in Qatar for the 2018 edition, only to be beaten on penalties by Alain in the quarterfinals. He's now in the Polish league fighting a dual promotion push and relegation battle in their equivalent of the championship with Stomil Olsztyn. They're four points off the promotion playoffs, six points above the relegation zone. It's definitely going to be an interesting run-in for the final 11 weeks of the season for Eric Malloy, formerly of Arklow Town and Wexford FC. And how's the lockdown been over there? Thanks very much for having me on. Um... What it's been like, it's been difficult, I suppose. Trainings and matches and all cancelled, and then you're put into quarantine and told you can't train or go outside your door. It has been tricky. But I think um, Poland have kind of really gone to the forefront and tried to get back football as quickly as possible because I think it benefits everyone getting it back like fans, clubs, players, everyone. So I think from the minute this quarantine really happened, they were following the guidelines from the government, but they were always thinking how to kind of nearly try and get football back or get it close to be coming back and trying to nearly push the boundaries but trying to be as actually following the proper protocol so there was no any of the government laws kind of being broken they kind of set out then a schedule every kind of nearly two weeks for clubs to kind of follow and stuff and they either added to it or kept it the same depending on the situation and, and the laws that were in place yeah we're, we're finally getting back to playing now and um, with our, the rest of the league uh, on tuesday yeah, and where you are at the moment with uh, Stummel Olstein is 12th place, but you're five points off the promotion playoffs and six points off the relegation spot. So, I mean, in one way, you're very, very well placed. Two wins out of the last five, two losses as well. So it's kind of been 50-50 in form uh, heading into the lockdown. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, um, the one thing that stands out with this league, it, it's a very tight league. There is no team that's, like, far ahead of anyone else and. I suppose, uh, yeah, one win or two could bring you a, few, a good few places up the table. We're very optimistic. Like, we're very positive. I feel like we kind of made one or two signings at the start of the year and training has been going really good of lately and, and you can start to see um, some really good patterns and some of the things we've been working on are starting to come off. We're feeling very excited, very happy to be back playing and uh, we're really looking forward to push forward. We, we want to finish in like the top five, top six, the promotion spots. It is mainly a, a, a Polish squad. You've got Czech player, Japanese, Albanian, Ukrainian, a Latvian goalkeeper. So it seems like there's a good mix of nationalities there. Yeah, no, there is. There's, there's definitely a good mix. But the one thing, at first when I arrived in, it was a little bit difficult with the, with the language. Most of the people spoke Polish, but some of them signings that have been the Brahim, they've all have really good English. So it's kind of been a, a bit of a positive for me. So I can talk and bounce more of my ideas off more of the players and I kind of make more friends because it, it's very hard to converse with someone that has zero English and I have zero Polish. There's only gestures and, and smiles and different things that, that communicate. So a friendship can kind of only go so far when you, when you can't really communicate. But yeah, there's a wide mix of players. So there's a very good experience and um, some different uh, ideas and stuff on football, which is always good to talk about. I mean, it's a sizable city. It's a regional city. How did you end up there in the first place for this season? Um, well, I probably came back from New Zealand. I was a bit, I spent three years out there for well, three seasons. And I came back to Ireland and, and I was thinking about what I was going to do next. I, I was trying to move on or move up. I had an option to stay in, again another season as well in New Zealand, but I decided I wanted to change to something different. Yeah, I've tried a few options. I was exercising a lot of contacts and stuff. And this kind of came up on a period where um, I didn't really have anything on that week. They said, if you can get over, like, I think this was on the, on the Thursday. And they said, oh, well, if you can get over on the Saturday and Sunday, we'll have a look at you. So I literally said, right, 
I booked a flight and I got over there, I think, Saturday and, and I trained and all week. At the end of the week, I liked it and, and they liked me as well. So they offered me a contract and I said, well, look, there was only six games left in League of Ireland. Most other places, they, they're kind of finishing or in the middle of the season. These were just kind of starting and I thought this would be a good, like, kind of fresh start. Get in here and try to uh, perform and, and play professionally, play every day. And I said, yeah, I liked it. So, so I eventually signed. <laughs> And here, here I am still. Uh, but I mean, you've had really a remarkable career because you you were with Arklow Town, uh, you were with Wexford for four seasons, five seasons. Then you went to Southern United. Then you were in Wellington. So three years in New Zealand and then Poland. And in one way or another, those are all quite remarkable moves. So how did they come about? Um, well, each move kind of came about a, a little bit differently. When I went to Arklow, I, I was... I was actually playing with FC Carlo before that. I don't know. It was like one of them forgotten clubs that somehow they didn't survive. But I thought I wanted to play underage football because I was only 17 at the time. So I wanted to play under 18, you know. And um, I went to Arklow under 18s. And then I kind of ended up uh, playing in their senior team then by chance. But I was looking to play in the under 18s, you know, and do well in under 18 football. My old manager for FC Carlo, Shane Keegan, got the job in Wexford. Even though before that, Noel O'Connor was on to me to come down before that. And I said, no, I'm not going to come down halfway through a season. I want to start a fresh start or nothing, you know. And uh, Shane Keegan then got the new job. So then I ended up going down to, to Wexford and played there for four years. That was great memories, great experience. And then it was an opportunity that came about um, that I heard of. The, the, a great opportunity to go to New Zealand from one of my former um Ireland University managers and Carlo IT managers, Paul O'Reilly, and he got a job out in New Zealand and then eventually got the head coach of Southern United and he was kind of asking around for players and I heard this opportunity so I said I just asked Paul, you know, what's going on, what is the situation? He kind of said, yeah, he was very interested and would like me to come out and kind of propose something for me and I was like, well, this is kind of an opportunity I can't turn down. It's only like three, four months and I can come back for League of Ireland season. But I ended up liking it so much in New Zealand that I, I stayed for a year, longer than I thought. And then I ended up doing well that season. And when I played well against my old team, Team Wellington, uh, um, in some of the matches we played in the league. And I, I did well. I scored like seven goals and a few assists for Southern. Like in comparison, Southern have never, they've probably only won one match in the whole year in the last three previous years. So now we've won a few games and I'm scoring a few goals and they're, they're kind of rising. People took notice of that and I probably um, had a few options. But when Team Wellington came in, I was like, yeah, I, have to, I just have to go. And it was an article um, that I said oh, I wasn't going to be signing with Southern and they seen it. And the manager got in contact with me and that's how I ended up in Team Wellington. And I really liked it there. So I stayed there for two years. And then, um, yeah, I was probably missing home a bit and the Ireland. And I kind of learned a lot from Team Wellington. And I thought... I want to try and move on and, and get into the professional setup. And I could have stayed in Wellington and been comfortable and enjoyed the lifestyle, but I said, no, I'm going to go out and search for something a little bit more um, challenging. And that's what I kind of did. And I, <laughs> the challenge led me to, to Stormill. I just wanted to ask since you were playing for uh, Tim Wellington about that crazy game against the line in the Club World Cup. Because before they came, everybody was saying, ah, oh, this is team from Oceania, they can't do anything. And then you're three nil up in I don't know how many minutes. So what happened in that game? Can you tell us a bit more about that particular game? Oh, that that one still hurts. <laughs> um, yeah, I can tell you. Um, we had very good tactics. We prepared very well for that. So we knew exactly what we were kind of going to expect from Alain. We knew them kind of inside out. We knew what they were going to do, and uh, we knew how we could hurt them. We knew our abilities. So we kind of we've been training towards that, even in practice games. Everything working on. Um, what we wanted to do and we, we executed everything we had a little bit more quality too we could have gotten maybe a fourth they ended up scoring just before half time to bring it 3-1 second half came out and I, I, I think that what really stood to us was you're playing in 30 something plus degrees heat we started to tire they're playing in that every day they don't you know they probably don't even feel it at this stage we started to feel it we're giving everything and yeah, I think we kind of slightly ran out of legs and when we started to, to run out of legs a bit they really started pushing forward, trying to hurt us. And we were, we were trying to hold on. And I think, yeah, they scored in the last five minutes to bring us to extra time. And then eventually went to penalties and we lost. But like, we, were, we were also testing ourselves to see how good we are against some of the, like, the world. Like, some of these players are class. Like, 
Caio signed with a Portuguese team for 40 million after that. Marcus Berg played in the, in the World Cup against Sweden, lost to England in the quarter final. Like, you're talking really quality players we're playing against. And it was good to see um, what level we're at and we could compete on that level. Yeah, Alain went to Honda to play Real Madrid in the final. So you're saying that they're one of the best teams in the tournament, Alain, and we, we put it really up to them. So it kind of just shows the quality that's actually there that, and the standard of coaching that we had in Team Wellington and actually in New Zealand too. That's kind of what happened, <laughs> in my view. How would you compare, actually, the competitive level of New Zealand league and football in general? Well, with Irish league, obviously, because you played in that league, but maybe with some, let's say, third, second tier divisions of Europe. I think it's underrated, massively, massively. There is a gap as well. Like, the other way with our Polish League One here, it's like they're all kind of similar teams, they're similar standard, similar professionalism, similar stadiums. You know, it's quite similar here. In Ireland, you have a bit of a gap. You have like a top two of Dundalk and Rovers, and then you have like another bunch, and maybe one or two at the bottom. Well, in New Zealand, it's like you have a top two like Ireland, and then you have like a pack of five, and then you have two or three that are not good at all. Like, there is a big gap there. But the, the top two, the quality they have is very, very under, underrated, in my opinion, from other, around the world. If Team Wellington, say, in Auckland came into the Irish League, I think they would be performing at Dundalk or Rovers level or not even higher, in my opinion. They're very um, heavily weighted on, on tactics, analysis and, you know, body shape, body position where you can hurt teams, this kind of stuff. Like, you know, it's very detailed. Like, it's very professional. The thing why I say it's underrated is because it's, when you're in that environment, it's very professional. But on the outside, everyone looking in, you just see, oh, New Zealand, amateur league. Oh, facilities aren't too, too great, you know. It's like, oh, they're, they're no good. And it's like people don't see what's actually going on behind the scenes in, in one or two of the clubs, you know. Uh, this is Stefan. Um, I have a question in relation to your spell in uh, Team Wellington. And uh, we know the A League is quite close to New Zealand, and uh, we have Wellington Phoenix playing the A League. Uh, for, you know, I did commentary on the A League for a few years as well, from a French you know, perspective. But have you any, any contacts with uh, Wellington Phoenix whatsoever? Yes, uh, actually, I do. Yeah. Surprisingly, um, I kind of moved house when I was in Wellington in the second year and I moved into like an apartment very close to the Wellington Phoenix guys, the younger guys who were in the academy and they've been training with the first team. So I got on like a house on fire with them, like very good, like they were really good friends and mates and they're only young lads so they didn't see some of the pitfalls and stuff I'd seen in football. So I, I would be helping them along and you think a 26 year old hanging out with 19, 20 year olds, you think, well, how is that going to work? But it actually we got on really well and um they introduced me to some of the other, um, one or two other Phoenix players, and I, I became very friendly with them also. And Team Wellington and Wellington Phoenix have a very good contact. So our head coach was best mates with the academy coach, and, and our assistant coach was already in the Phoenix as well, coaching too. So there's a real strong connection there. And the, the thing is, yeah, I've kind of tried, I tried to get in there, but the difficulty with getting into Wellington Phoenix was they have five import spots, and if you look at some of the, the, the quality of the imports that they're taking in, like you know, Stephen Taylor's played, I don't know how many games, and Captain Newcastle, and I don't know if he's in or around an England squad, I'm not sure. I can't, the quality he has, he's one of their imports. And David Ball, I think, is <laughs> Man City, was it? Or he's played at a very top level too. Like They're the kind of imports that they had coming in. So that was always ruling against me. Saying that, I was on their radar. They were um, in contact with me, and... They were waiting on, on two contacts, and if the two contacts didn't come through, I was going to be having a look at and possibly of signing, you know. But the two contacts decided to go with the Phoenix, so I then actually had to look for other options. You spent two, and a, two years and a half in uh, New Zealand. And we know that New Zealand, it's, uh, it's a ruby uh, country, and uh, they're, all, they're all blacks, and we talk very little about the all white. They went to the World Cup, you know, a few years ago. And w w what is your view about, you know, football in New Zealand? Have you seen like a change, you know, for since the World Cup, you know, participation from the uh, the New Zealand, or can you see like more kids playing you know, football in the streets or or in school? Like, oh, hundred percent. Since I moved out in three years, within three years, the difference has been. Uh, I think so, uh, Paul O'Reilly and some of my mates down in Southern, um, Conor O'Keefe, Stephen Last, 
Andy Mulligan, Danny Ledwood, uh, Danny Furlong and them. They all did a very good job down there developing football. But also, Team Wellington was heavily involved with the community and, and working with um, young players and all that. And I have seen, like, rugby is massive down there. It's like they play that in schools. They're, they're in the lunch uh, break time. They, they have rugby balls, like, say, we would have hurls or slitters or, you know, in, in Kilkenny, for example, you know, going around with them. But in the last, I think there was a kind of a, a research done lately and said that football has actually, in the youth, kind of an underage, has the numbers of outgrown rugby. That's how big football is starting to grow in, in New Zealand. The thing about New Zealand was they had a bit of... The only way to put it was it was very similar to what happened with John Delaney in the FBI. I'm not sure what went on, but the, the, the head kind of guy that was in charge, I think, got dismissed and certain things were uh, happening in New Zealand football, which didn't really bode well. And then the New Zealand national team didn't have a game for a year, just over a year. Like So uh, I'm not sure what went on there. Uh, that wasn't looking good, you know, it... You want your national team performing well because then all the kids have something to aspire to and look up to. In that regard, I think the underage help, they all like football and parents are getting them into football. But uh, the national team and that probably needs to gain back a little bit of reputation, which I think it will because they have some fantastic players playing overseas and they have very good young players playing overseas too. So if you give them one or two years and they come back into the New, Ze- New Zealand setup, it, it looks very promising. Hi Eric, uh, Mark here. Hey Mark. Um, yeah, just want to ask: Did um, obviously playing in the Club World Cup was a highlight, but did um, scoring against Chelsea for Bose help your move? Maybe last summer. Um, I'm not too sure. I never asked, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a bit of a surreal um, highlight. I was more shocked by the the whole thing. When I heard about, oh, um, actually, we have a friendly this weekend. I was like, okay, maybe it's a Leinster Senior League or something like that, you know? Next time I heard Chelsea, I was like, oh, lads, you're taking the piss here. Who, who's, uh, who's, who's having me on here? And I was like, no, we're actually, um, you're meant to keep it quiet. We're playing Chelsea. And I was like, that more shook me. Um, because I was uh, training with Bows and Pats, you know, and I was looking to try and show them what I could do. And also, I, I was trying to keep fit myself, you know? Because I'd come back to New Zealand and I had kind of a three or four weeks, well, not off, but like no touches of a football, more gym work. And I was like, I need to get back out playing and keeping that right. So I wanted to get into a game or in training. So I was training with them and when I heard it was a game, I was happy. But when it was Chelsea, I was just like, this couldn't be sweet early. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us about the goal? How many uh, top defenders did you dribble past? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't think there was too too much <laughs> dribbling. I, I just remember um, watching the game, and and from the weeks before I was training, I, I'd always uh, Keith. Um, he was always very um, in training. Very, he looked forward all the time. The minute he got the ball, he always looked forward. So when I when I was seeing the situation arise, I just seen that we were about to win the ball back. I could see uh, Keith in space, and I was like he's going to play forward. I need to be in front of him. I just need to be there. So I seen we just won the ball back and the pass then went to him. So I was already on my bike, took off and I'd seen a gap between centre back and full back. And I was like, I just need to be there because I know what's going to happen. <laughs> I was lucky enough to kind of outpace the, the full back. He didn't see the situation as quick and he was probably tired. I was you know, a little bit fresher. And uh, yeah, I took, took a, very, a good pass and I took a very good touch and, I went to go across the keeper, uh, looked across the keeper and everything like that. And last second, I went right. So I think the keeper kind of thought I was going to go go to his right, you know. And at last second, I went to my right. And uh, yeah, delighted I went in. <laughs> and uh, obviously, it's um, you said you liked the challenge, you wanted a challenge, but it's a huge challenge going to, obviously, New Zealand's other side of the world, but Poland, you've got a whole different... Um, hurdles to overcome did did you get any advice before you went over or did you just see, see what it was like there was not really much advice at all it was, it was like i heard i just heard yeah it's a good club go and see what you think and i was like yeah i'll go over here and see what i think i don't have to sign anything and i just went over and yeah it was difficult with the language you know like players are a bit nervous speaking english and don't really want to speak English too much, you know. And I'm coming into their kind of club and stuff, and you're trying as a new player. Everyone kind of literally, you know, are weary of you and curious, like what's this lad like and everything. 
it's a difficult challenge and, and, and the difficulty then you, you're trying to talk, you, you can't really communicate as much. You have to show people what you're like by your actions. So that, that was most important to me when I come out here. You try and do the right thing. You have to be a lot more um, visual. Even if you're tired and stuff, the minute the coach, you have to look up, you have to see what he's saying, seeing what's going on. You have to be more proactive and ask people what's what's happening, what's going on, what's tomorrow. It, it has had its challenges, don't get me wrong. Um, but like at the end of the day, like uh, football is kind of a universal language. So I think lads kind of notice after a week or two that, you know, he's decent, he understands things, he he's able to help the team and stuff like this. And then things start to become a lot easier then after, after a few weeks, you know. Killian Sheridan's a couple hours up the road from you, I think. Um, have you any cause to reach out to him or anything like that over the couple of months you've been there? Or, or did you meet? Did you miss each other in, in Wellington? You're a different clubs. I don't know if you're in New Zealand at the same time. That's, that's actually a strange thing that happened as we did bump into each other in, <laughs> in Wellington. I think there was a weekend where we had both uh, Wellington Phoenix and us had like um, a weekend off and I, I managed to meet him in, in, a, in a bar because... Some of the Team Wellington lads are friends with the Wellington Phoenix guys because a lot of the well, Team Wellington team is made up of ex-Phoenix players. So they've all played with the Phoenix and know the lads. So I ended up meeting them out there and chatting to them. I, never, I didn't really know of them before this, you know. But then when I heard about him and what he's done, I was kind of like, oh, wow, you know. And another Irish guy out here is great to just hear the accent. And then, um, yeah, he signed in Poland. And then maybe, I'd say a few, one or two months later, he signed in, in Poland. And it was interesting because he was already signed in Poland before. Mm. And it's interesting, a player like, like him, and he's played Champions League football, played with Celtic and stuff, uh, chose to come back to Poland. Out of other places he could have went, it, it, it kind of shows you, like, the, the certain aspects here in Poland, it, it, football is actually very good. Like, it's very professional. Fans, you're treated like you're kind of like a top footballer here. Like, totally different than New Zealand and Ireland. It's a, it's a little bit more pushed to the side and go, oh, you play soccer well here it's more like it's a big bigger deal so i can see why he's chosen to kind of come here as well no i haven't reached out to him of yet but i do see his instagram <laughs> <laughs> stories now and again and stuff what he puts up and it's quite he's quite funny and one, one last one for me as well um just uh, does does there's not that many irish players go abroad carlo is is has booked the trend a little bit with padre garment um going to portugal but with pasos de ferreira but in terms of you know going beyond England or Scotland, you know, is it is it something you'd recommend, or is it something that you could see more more Irish players doing in future? You know, you're describing just the the levels of professionalism and stuff like that you're seeing it um, in in different countries and the opportunities that are there. Yeah, like in my personal opinion, it's a great opportunity for people to do it. Now, saying that, it is very difficult. Like I can see why people don't. You really have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to have a mentality where, like, whatever challenge is put in front of you, it's it's literally just a little obstacle. Like, no matter how difficult things are, you have to have, like, the end goal or, or your end aim in sight all the time. And no matter how difficult that is, you, you have to take responsibility for a lot of things. Like, you have to be very accountable for everything you do. It's a very difficult uh, thing to move abroad, but I tell you, the positives of doing it is you learn to be able to deal with any challenge. You learn the right way to do things. You're kind of freed from any stigmas that are back home, like if people think you're this or you were that when you were 16, <laughs> 17. It's like you develop and grow and improve so much since, since then. It's like people then actually see your ability for how it is. And the thing is, yeah, you learn so much about football. Like if you're playing a different country or a different club, they have different concepts, different styles, they have different ideas. And if you're very attentive and you're eager to learn, you can develop very quickly by kind of going from, say, two years, three years in one club to another club. You can pick up so much knowledge and information that can make you um, a lot better than if you just stay in the one environment all the time. So I do find if, if a person has a strong personality or wants to have a strong personality, I think going abroad is a fantastic opportunity. Plus, you get to see, travel and see the world and play football at the same time. Like, I personally think it, it's great. It's not the, as you said before, not the typical going to England and stuff. But my journey wasn't about going to England and getting into a club where you get paid big money. 
my journey was more I want to go and kind of see and learn and develop. I want to improve. That's all with an ultimate goal. I want to be at the best. I want to get to the best or highest level myself or, or best performance level that maybe I have a chance of getting in and, and really helping, say, the Ireland team, for example. It's that ultimate uh, aim that I'm constantly trying to strive towards. Still on that journey. <laughs> Eric, uh, back in October, your team were just three points off the top. And then suddenly the goals dried up. Uh, you haven't won for a month and a half, almost two. So what happened? So you're closer to relegation zone now than to promotion. At first, I was just kind of uh, watching everything and seeing how how the team play and stuff. And the league is so close. I I kind of understand. I understand the reasons why, but I don't think I I should probably say this because I don't want to be calling out any player or anything else in the club or anything to do with that. But in regards to some of the games, we have been a bit unlucky in regards to, you know, we were nil-nil in one game pushing. We've missed some chances that were like, the ball's been crossed, he's headed it or he's he had a shot and it's just narrowly went wide. And then in, that, in the, say, the same game, the team had a throw in around the halfway line. The ball by gives it to the striker who's right nearly 10 metres from the corner flag. He throws it in to the, to the winger and the winger shoots and he scores and we lose 1-0 in like the last 10 minutes. And then you're losing a point there. And also, like we've had, in our case, that I think we should have had maybe one or two more penalties where our striker has been manhandled and literally nothing given. Well, the opposition, we've been given a few penalties against us. I'm not trying to say anything about officiating or anything like that. I'm just trying to say that in football, decisions kind of are made. And in this league where everything's so tight, they're the difference between points of you going third and fourth to like where we are at the minute. But I think we've worked on a lot of other things now in the last... We've had a lot of preparation because of this coronavirus and the mid-season break that's here in Poland. I feel a lot more positive and, and that we can actually fight our way through to another few um, wins and, and get higher up. Considering that it's officially a second language in Ireland, I just wanted to ask, you should move for Polsku. Małe do Polsku. <laughs> dobre, dobre. Uh, I, I kind of listen to uh, some of the everyday slang and uh, it's, it's only one or two words that, in a sentence I can put but usually I only need one word to communicate you know I, I kind of can get the gist of what people are saying and then I kind of can, <laughs> can can say in one word response to something so they understand what, uh, you know I understand what they're saying I, I can pick up the little things <laughs> Your first steps at Wexford in the first division and getting promotion to the uh, Premier Division and then moving to uh, New Zealand and then now in Poland. As you game change, you know, as a player, have you made, you know, some great improvements, you know, in your game? And can you tell us a bit, a bit more about your progression? Yeah. Player? Oh, definitely. Like, <laughs> massive, massive. I, I reflect a lot. When I was in Wexford, I was kind of a kid. Uh, kind of like not really 100% focused not really um, really in tune with everything in football and, and understand how everything works. You know, I was just learning. I was just giving myself 100% effort and just trying my best. But it was, I didn't really learn, like, say, for example, the tactic side of it, the, the importance of things you do outside of football, um, the, even the mentality. I, I was only young then, you know. I, I, I kind of look back and say, how did I play back then, you know? I, I, you know, looking back at myself, I think, Oh, like I wasn't that good, you know. Now it's like every kind of season I've I've kind of like grew a bit. Whether in Wexford, I think I've grown more physically. Like I was more into like strength training and exercises like that and, and fitness. But when I went to to New Zealand, the game, the pace, and the style of football is all around tactics, and it's a little bit slower and more uh, thought. Like you, you, there's more thought process involved. In Ireland, it's a lot faster and it's like quick. Um, so I learned a lot more about tactics then, and especially when I went to um, Team Wellington. And, and, and my first season was difficult there. I'm not going to lie. Um, I was physically strong, very fit compared to all the players. But tactically, I was nowhere near it. Nowhere near the rest of the lads. And I really needed to work on that. And also, technically, the guys in Team Wellington, I could make up for a lot of things through my pace and through my fitness. But if I, re if I wanted to do well, I knew I had to improve technically as well. Uh, my touch, my ability to perform certain skills, one touch and these sort of things. So I had to work 
basically stop doing kind of more strength work, heavy strength work, and doing more flexibility work to get myself flexible enough to be able to perform some of the skills that, they get, that you need in the high level. So I worked on that constantly. Um, I did notice, though, after a while, after two years, that I wasn't as quick, but I was a lot more technical. And by the end of it, like, my technical ability was very good. And I was um, performing things that, like, I would never have been able to do when, say, Wexford or stuff. Towards the end of Team Wellington, I started getting back into my strength work. Yeah, when I was in Ireland and I worked on more resistance work. I, like, I always kind of researched. I've always looked up stuff, asked people questions, physios, picked their brains to, to find out why I'm doing this or what's this extra for, to understand. I put the emphasis on myself to know my body and to get to the level where I need it. Not on any physio, not on any a doctor, not on any coach. It was all my doing. So I, I really kind of gathered information and then pr- performed whatever I was doing, the exercises and activities, and then reflected on them to see if they were working. And I, every time I kept tailored them, tailored them, tailored them to, to what I need to improve. So then when I came to um, Stormill, I'd say they were a bit shocked that like I was physically fit and strong, but also very flexible and I had like a good technical ability and they could see this. And then they were more focused on, oh, is he mentally tough and is he, is he physically able for this level of this league? Because it's a physical league. So they put me through a week of like two trainings on a Monday, three on a Tuesday, two more on a Wednesday. And they brought me in at like 7.30 in the morning to do a bleep test, kind of yo-yo test, on, on the morning after a heavy training. When some guys have only done two and three trends in the week, uh, who's like been tested rigorously. And at the end of that week, you know, I played well in the, all the games. But I was so knackered. I said I needed two, two days off or I'm going to break down because you just can't put anyone through this and expect them to just keep doing it. And so they, they actually were really happy and offered me a contract and they gave me a bit of rest as well. So I have, like, the player I have, have been since Wexford to now has just been a, a dramatic, dramatic change. And I'm very aware of, like, tactics, positioning, things I would never have had a clue of when I was in Wexford. I worked on a lot of skills that are required for, say, the top level. You look at the Bryna and you think, how is he putting a ball in around the back four on the ground or with such pace and stuff? And I'm like... Well, I've been working on that and I've become very, very good at that kind of, it's nearly a strength now. And I've been working on my technical ability. So like before you'd be iffy about your touch, oh, can I control it? Can I control it? Now it's like, oh, I'm, I'm nearly 90% sure I can control whatever is kind of, it will go where I kind of want it. I have improved massively and it's like, I still have the mentality to, to continue to do so. I mean, brilliant stuff, Eric. Thanks very much for that. And I mean, the the city that you're in, it's around the size of Cork City, something around a quarter of a million. So if you manage to get up, you're not far off the playoffs, it would be a really big deal for the city then. Oh, huge. Uh, football is taken massively here. Similar to how it would be with, with the you know clubs and GAA and the, the community. It's like football is like that here and it's just on a big kind of scale. So it would be a massive deal. That's what I'm aiming, or I'm, well, we're aiming to do is to try and get the club up there and, and ha- get into promotion. And how close do you feel then to the Ireland squad that you mentioned earlier, if you were able to get up into the top flight or if you ended up playing somewhere else? I have no idea. It's not, <laughs> it's not in my control. <laughs> uh, you know, the football is about um, subjective to other people, you know. You have to kind of produce... Um, and this is why I'm looking forward to football coming back so that I can show people what I can do so that they can, so that everyone can form their own opinions, you know, and hopefully good ones. <laughs> but that, that wouldn't be my job. <laughs> That'd be more your job or uh, other people in the Ireland set up and stuff. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Listen, that's great, Eric. And best of luck for the rest of the season with the promotion push. Hopefully it will be a promotion push. And we'll be hearing a lot more about you over the next couple of months. Oh, yeah, hopefully, definitely. And thanks very much for all your questions and uh, your curiosity. I appreciate it.
Estomel Allstein joining nil nil with Krobri Gwogov midweek, back in action on Sunday. So to our Flora Tallinn and a busy week coming in Estonia, where a midweek round means they'll all be playing three games in the space of ten days. And two of Flora's fixtures are big Tallinn derbies. First this weekend, it's 2018 Champions Number Kalyu away. Then on Wednesday week, the biggest game of the season in terms of crowds, Flora against Lavadia Tallinn. Marcus Poem has helped Flora to two of the last three titles in Estonia. He's now a senior international for his country and unlike his father, is an attacking midfielder. He's Derby born as well. So Marcus currently lying second, two points behind Lavadia, four wins, one draw, unbeaten and a good start to the season. Yeah, exactly. So it's always good to start the league again. Uh, it's been a long waiting process, but I think we're uh, everyone's eager to start playing a lot of games again and just uh, getting back to their full fitness. And have you noticed, that, is there a bit more attention on the Estonian league now that you're one of the few leagues that have started up early again in Europe? Yeah, I think there, there's been a little more attention. And I think that uh, Estonians also sense that, that it's, uh, we're quite proud that we started up so quickly. Uh, we've also... Uh, given our television rights to uh, a foreign country to show our games, such as uh, that showed our games in Macedonia, Serbia and other countries like that. So I think it's always positive that you know other countries can also see what our league's like. And how is life in Estonia at the moment? Uh, uh, still a little bit different from usual? I think, uh, yeah, it's a little bit different, but also from today, the regulations have gone uh, less, so we don't have any more these uh, strict regulations, and uh, it's getting better, but better by better every week. But uh, you can also feel that the people are a little bit uh, on edge, which is normal. I think that's in every country, and I think even if this uh, coronavirus all goes away, it, it will still uh, have some impact. That life won't be like it was before. So I think things will never be like it was before, but I think that's also a good thing that we're more cautious of uh, how we live our everyday life. So as a player, how frustrating had it been to have just got you know, a round underway, the first match played, a cup tie played after that, and then you have to shut down as a professional footballer for over two months? Yeah, of course, it was a big shock. I think at first there was so much of the feeling that you don't know what's going to happen. So... Uh, we were just uh, updated daily to find out uh, if we can start training, what will our training even look like, uh, when would the league start up again. So there's been a lot of unknowns, but uh, finally we're up and running, so that's positive. And the first game back, it was a live TV game against uh, Tamika of Tartu. And like, was there a bit of rustiness having not played, not had got much training underway? It finished nil-nil. It's your only drop point so far of the season. Yeah, of course. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of rust in us, but I think all the players are really eager to show. And by that also, there can be a lot of mistakes coming in that you want to show a lot of your ability, but maybe your ability isn't at its peak. So uh, it's hard. And also because the stadium, in the stadium, there aren't people allowed to watch the games. It was uh, quite a surreal feeling that especially if we play in a big stadium but it's uh, very well uh, heard everything that's said on the pitch it also takes away a bit of that feeling because I think that uh, football is never really the same without fans so uh, that that was also a part that uh, well it, it plays a big part of uh, how if we play our best game or slightly uh, worse uh, Marcus, you stayed on the bench uh, for that first game against uh, Tamika. You, then you came on as a substitute to the next one when Ayn Salo was injured uh, very early in the game. Uh, so wh why did you stay uh, on the bench in those f first uh, two games? Was there any particular reason for it? I think there wasn't any particular reason. Maybe uh, because I'm also coming back from an injury and because we are thought to win every game. So uh, I think it was a game that was really tight against Tameka that maybe uh, the coach didn't want to uh, change too much of the players because we were actually playing uh, really okay in the second half and we had a couple of good chances to win the match. 
but it didn't uh, just go our way. So, of course, uh, I wasn't uh, mad about not playing because because uh, I also understand the coach. I also uh, know that every player on the team is really important. And uh, at the end of the day, it's a team sport. So the three points are the most important. And unfortunately, we just missed out on them on that day. Is that because of injury that you didn't start as many games last season in 2019 as you did in 2018? Because you were regular in 2018. You were playing in the first 11 and then it was, I think, only seven games in the starting lineup last season. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. At the, the start of last season, I had an ankle injury that put me out from six to eight week, uh, weeks. So um, after that, because the team started playing uh, really well without me, it was hard to uh, come back and uh, get back in the starting lineup. But uh, I think that it was also a good learning point for me last year because I hadn't had an injury that was quite so big that I had to be out for that long. And uh, yeah, I think I learned a lot about myself as a player last season. And I feel that this season gradually uh, become a better player. And uh, I feel like it could be a good year for me to show my ability. Because you're with one of the main teams in Estonia, as you say, expected to win almost every game, that obviously then means, I guess, the big diaries against Levadia. That's the thing that everybody focuses on for a lot of the season. Biggest crowds and so on. Most attention. Yeah, of course. Uh, Flora has always been thought to at least uh, be a contender for the championship. So uh, we know that uh, we have to basically win every game and uh, with that comes a lot of pressure. But I think it's almost uh, normal already that we have that kind of pressure because the team that we have right now, we played uh, together for a lot of years. We have a good balance with experienced players, with young players. And everyone knows that in Florida, you have to win, you know, even if sometimes the media writes us off. But uh, we know deep down that we have the ability to be champions again. You've won two of the last three titles. There's a motivation then to win every season, to try, even if you've got three in a row or four in a row, that we have to do it again, that that is the job. Yeah, of course, uh, you know, when the season finishes, uh, you already have to a little bit think about the next season. You know, everything starts from zero. There are no points uh, that we have above others. Everyone has a fair chance at uh, winning the title and uh, it means nothing the last uh, championship. So we just have to focus on the now, uh, what was before was before. If we live in the past, I think that's just not good enough for the supporter. So we always have to try to be better the next year. What was it like growing up as the son of a professional footballer, Mark Pum, the goalkeeper who spent a lot of time in England? You were born in Derby yourself. What age were you that that you realised, you know, your father was someone who was actually quite well known? I think it's gradually been uh, uh, something that I've known, like, uh, all of my life that my father is well known. I think when I moved back to, well, when I moved to Estonia, I think then I gradually understood just how big of an impact my father has had on Estonia or football in general. Obviously, living in England you could always uh, see that there was a uh, little, bit, little bit more attention on our family, but it wasn't something that uh, really bothered me or something that I, I thought to myself that that's weird because it was just, I, I didn't know anything else. And it's always been kind of just a part of uh, how everyday life is. Um, how old were you when you moved back? I was uh, 11 years old. Mm. So, okay, so you're quite significant. So, like, would English have been your first language at home or, or Estonian? Uh, it was mostly Estonian, but it was a little bit of a mix of both. So, uh, because my Estonian wasn't the greatest, so I would speak in kind of a mixed language using Estonian words, using the English words. Uh, but I think gradually moving to Estonia, uh, just thinking in Estonian before English, came in a couple of months so it wasn't that big of a transition for me like when your father was moving around clubs then was the family moving as well because he obviously derby then he went to Sunderland, then he was in london for a bit with arsenal watford 
Yeah, fine. Uh, we always uh, moved with him. I think at the start, uh, he would go there alone, especially when he moved uh, to London to play for Arsenal first. I remember we always took the train to go up to see him uh, nearly every weekend. But uh, yeah, gradually we would always move to where he was. And it was just a normal part of uh, being son of a footballer. And also, you know, the family had to adapt with that. Uh, as I had to move to schools uh, and also uh, new friends living in a new area. So, of course, it wasn't easy. But uh, I think our family understands that that's the price you have to pay. Did you start playing football in England? Yeah, I started playing uh, in England. At first, uh, I started training when we were at Sunderland. Uh, I think I just uh, went to like a football camp that was two, three times a week. But I think it got more serious when we moved to London, when I started playing Sunday League. And then after that, I got into the Watford Academy. And uh, I was in the Watford Academy for three, three to four years before moving to Estonia. And when you moved to Estonia, of course, you kept playing football. But was there a difference in the level of, say, coaching, organization, preparation, comparing to England? Uh, yeah, of course, there's, uh, there's always different types of uh, football, every, I think, in a, each country. In uh, England, uh, obviously, the competition is really high. So uh, even when I was playing in Watford Academy, uh, we had new trialists coming in to do, try to get in the team uh, almost every week but uh, back in Estonia I think you have a little bit more freedom maybe not that much of a competition so uh, it's different but I think that also this competition in English it, in England it, it also helps, helps the player to really really be tough uh, mentally at a very young age when you're nine, ten years old and you already have two three players who want your spot in the team uh, you really have to grow up quickly. And I think that was a really good learning process. Uh, your father was a goalkeeper. We have some examples of uh, sons of uh, famous goalkeepers doing the same thing. And you, you playing as an attacking midfielder. Didn't your father tell you, no, you go in goal? Yeah, he he never told me that. I think I've never really felt pressure to be a uh, goalkeeper. And I think especially my mother... Uh, wouldn't want me to be a goalkeeper because uh, she's seen all of the uh, injuries and maybe the bad games that my father's had. Uh, so I think for her it was even a relief that I chose to play uh, outfield. I just felt that it, all the time growing up, uh, I just felt more joy putting my father in the goal and shooting against him than him uh, shooting against me. So it was just something that uh, became natural for me. And now that you're back home in Estonia, I mean, do you find that, I mean, because of the surname, like, you know, Jordi Cruyff, people were watching him anyway, a lot more than if he was Jordi Smith or something like that. Do you find that there's a bit more attention on you because you've also now played for Estonia? You're, you're a second generation, Boom, as a, as a professional footballer. Yeah, of course, there's uh, pressure. But I think because it's, there's always been that kind of pressure. It's kind of normal for me. I just dealt with it and tried not to think about it because uh, this pressure builds up in the media. And uh, the last thing I want is to be caught up with kind of uh, the hype. So uh, I think it's easier to kind of make the news uh, using my name and uh, mentioning my father. But I guess it's it's just uh, the price I have to pay for, to, to being his son. But uh, yeah, I think when I was coming up in the Estonian League, it was uh, really easy to kind of put my name and uh, mention also him in the news. But uh, gradually, I think I'm trying to make my own stamp and uh, make my own name. So that's what I'm uh, really trying to work towards. I suppose for a lot of us, Flora, Levadia, Nomakalju would get most notice in Europe during the qualifiers of the Champions League and the Europa League but it'll be a little bit more difficult this year because obviously things are being moved in the calendar so it might be later in the year that we get a chance to see you and 
you know, the weather might be turning a little bit cool. How difficult is it for Estonian clubs? Not Mikhail, you played Celtic last season, for example. How, how difficult is it for where you are in Europe to, to get through the rounds, to get near the group stages? Yeah, I think it's uh, always been a big challenge for Estonian clubs, especially uh, playing against big teams in Europe because our league maybe isn't the most competitive, but we're gradually trying to up the competitiveness every year. But because the competitiveness isn't so big, then sometimes it's easy to kind of have some easier games and kind of not give you uh, the best of your ability. So uh, actually, it's really hard for us to just focus on the main goal, which is actually winning the championship, of course, but also playing good in Europe. And if we focus on that, it, it means that we have to take every game like it's our last and then we'll always be ready for Europe. And I think uh, that's also the philosophy of Flora, that our ambition isn't only to win the league every year, but it's also to gradually play better in Europe, take the next steps there and see how far we can go. How would you deal with the reality as well? Because we see it in the League of Ireland that if a player is particularly good, they go through a few rounds in Europe that more than likely, you know, within a month, they'll be playing in England again. In the case where the best, you know, domestic players in Estonia, the ones who play internationally, end up playing abroad, how do you manage to keep the incentive going? Because the best players will usually end up playing abroad for a while. I think it's, uh, especially with this Europe Games, there's also a lot of, uh, let's say, noise that goes around the match. You know, everyone, you, you don't know who's watching. There can be agents, people from uh, clubs abroad. So uh, I think it's, always important to really focus on the goal at hand which is uh, right now you're at this club you have to play well this game and also finish uh, this season and after that you can look what's happening if you move abroad or not and I think it's all, it's also a big task for the team to keep everyone happy keep everyone focused so no one uh, goes along with all this uh, noise and we can uh, really be together and uh, try to uh, achieve our goal. Yeah, well, Marcus, in the game against Kalev, you assisted really well uh, around the up and, and you, we can say you assisted in the second goal because it was your shot that was saved and then he scored. And you could have scored as well with a great shot, but goalkeeper just reacted to it. And just seeing that game, I was thinking of how to define you as a player. It seems like you're an attacking midfielder who is timing really well your movement towards the box. So you appear when you can make that pass, you can make that shot, but how would you define yourself as a footballer? I think I'm uh, I'm a really interesting footballer in the way that uh, I'm almost like a box-to-box midfielder. So I like to take the ball from, uh, let's say, my defenders and uh, really create the play, but also I like to finish the play. So get into the box, uh, take the final shot, uh, give an assist. So for me, it's it's come naturally because uh, when I moved uh, from England to Estonia, I started playing midfield because in England I was playing uh, left back at Watford. So when I started playing in midfield, it was uh, our philosophy that I had this kind of freedom to really uh, take the ball and make the plays and also finally arrive in the box. So I think it's also a bonus for me that because of my ability, I can play holding midfielder, attacking midfielder, box-to-box midfielder. So it uh, gives me a lot of options and also the coach a lot of options in uh, in uh, how to use me on the field. Now you have as a teammate uh, Konstantin Vasily, one of the greatest Estonian players ever. What is there to learn from a footballer like him? I think there's a lot to learn. Uh, he's an amazing player with an amazing career and, and, and we don't even have to talk about uh, what he's done for the national team. Uh, he's just a really professional and a really good character to have uh, in the changing room. You know, everything he says to any player is worth listening to. And uh, also on the field, you know, if you have a guy like him next to you, it's uh, easy to rely on him on the when it gets tough and also to find a way to let him make you better because his passes are, are sometimes so good that you don't even understand them. And after you think, like, how did he see that pass? 
and uh, it's just the way he is and he's like that uh, every day in training in the matches and he's a really fundamental part of the Florida squad right now. So we're not trying to get you sold or to fish you off to agents or so on but is there a sort of an ambition in the average Estonian league player to say I would love a chance at a bigger league at some stage? I think there has to be especially in uh, if you play for FC Florida your ambitions have to be big because if you already play for FC Florida I think you have to be one of the best footballers in Estonia so uh, your ambitions uh, shouldn't stop there and I think it's almost easy to kind of feel good about your position and and uh, yeah you're fighting for the title every year but Ultimately, I think uh, you will grow more as a player if you work towards uh, finally playing abroad. So I think that it's uh, very important for any player to think like this because in Estonia, I, I don't think that many people feel like they're a fully professional player before the, I think they make their move abroad. Also, moving abroad uh, brings you the chance to play for the national team more than maybe playing the Estonian league and uh, that would also be a big step forward for any player and in the next few weeks Flora you've got big derbies against Novakalju you're playing Levadia the week after how much do you look forward to a schedule like that with big games one after the other I think it's uh, obviously enjoyable that uh, we have these games because we were so long without any games they're now having a really tight schedule and Almost every game looks like it will be a tough one. So uh, it's really enjoyable to train every day to work uh, towards some kind of goal because at one point we didn't have anything to really look forward to but just thinking that maybe the league will start again. So now that we have these games in place, it's almost easier to train and be focused so we can be ready for every game that's uh, to come. As we speak, it's the 1st of June, but exactly four years ago, on the 2nd of June of 2016, you made your debut for the under-19 uh, national team, and you were still 17 at the time. Over those four years, what would be the highlights of you playing for different uh, national teams of Estonia? Was it the, the goal you scored against Slovakia for under-21, so a couple of games against Spain that must have been a really, really good learning curve? Yeah, of course. I think playing in the national team at any youth age is a um, really big pleasure for any player and uh, it's a big achievement and yeah especially usually my debuts have gone really well so for the under 21s I brought on my debut that was obviously a really good day for me personally but unfortunately we lost that match so that was a kind of bittersweet feeling uh, also making my uh, national team debut in Qatar and Finland for me, it was also a big day and uh, an enjoyable day. I think also I've had one game for them, 23, where I also captained the squad and I scored. So that was also a very good day for me and the team. I just feel that there's always this passion and pressure to win in a good way that comes naturally by being in the national team. And I re always really enjoyed that. Yeah, but you mentioned that, okay, the still team lost to, to Slovakia when you scored for under 21s. And probably that's the feeling you go away with after so many games for, for the national team. So would there be, alongside you, a generation of players who can say, okay, that's enough. We can do what Latvia did in 2004, let's say, and qualify for the European Championship or do something that would get us closer to a bigger tournament? Yeah, I think it's something that is always, well, people are always looking to how can we improve? How can we uh, build up our football, our philosophy? So gradually we can be on the bigger stages. But I think it's also a learning process that sometimes we might play well and uh, we will lose the match. And I felt that this was the case many times with the under-21. That actually we had a really good squad. Uh, we could play nice football, but... Uh, we just had something missing and I think when we find uh, what has been missing, then uh, we will all, always make the jump forward. But I think that uh, the national team is really having a lot of uh, spotlights and trying to find ways to be better and really make that step so everyone feels determined to do that. Were you at the stadium when Estonia played Ireland in the qualifiers for the Euro 2012? Uh, yes, I remember even going uh, to the stadium when, when uh, they played here in Estonia. 
and uh, it was really a big occasion so I remember it really well so that's something to look forward to and then become a winner in such a game yeah of course I think it would be any footballer's dream to play in those kind of games you know obviously in that game I played Konstantin Vasilev so to be able to train with him I think it also shows that uh, to learn from him you can also maybe be there one day and uh, these games you know are are not only popular in Estonia, but all around the world, from playing against Thailand or whoever. So uh, it would be really a big goal for me to someday maybe firstly play in the national team again and uh, maybe try to get into the playoffs. Listen, Marcus, thank you very much for that. Best of luck for the rest of the season. You still have most of the rest of the season to go, but I hope it goes well for you and the rest of the time, the rest of the year, general life in Estonia. Yeah, thank you. That's it for now. The next couple of weeks see La Liga, Serie A and the Premier League all return. It's definitely been fun turning the spotlight on some more unusual leagues for you. As usual, please do like, rate and subscribe where possible. It helps others see it. And we're now also on YouTube and Acast as well. Until next time then, from Dimitri Zulai, Stefan Jorni, Mark Rodden and me, Will Downing, it's goodbye. Look after yourselves. <laughs>